You know that portion of scripture that we read, it contains four episodes. The first episode is how salvation travels to a pagan territory of Tyre and Sidon. While there, Jesus, uh, we have the second episode with the Syrophesian woman. And then we see Jesus feed 4,000 in pagan territory. And then the, uh, the Pharisees come and they begin to argue with him. Today we're going to focus on two and four. Salvation travels to a pagan territory of Tyre and Sidon where they are thankful and satisfied. Remember uh, what happened in uh, Mark chapter 6 when Jesus goes to his hometown in Nazareth and they didn't believe and he marveled at their unbelief. And he says, the Bible says Jesus only could heal a few sick people there. And at the end of chapter 6, verse 51 through 56, Jesus travels to Gennesaret. They see him get out of the boat and they run throughout the countryside and they grab every sick person they can find and they just try to lay him, those people in the path where Jesus is walking so the sick can just reach out, flick their hands across the hem of his garment and get healed. God, for whatever reason, limits his activity or expands his activity according to our faith. So in Tyre and Sidon, this is the only time recorded in the Bible where Jesus actually left Israel. In Tyre and Sidon, they are thankful and they get satisfied. Being thankful is an expression of faith. When we are whining, when we're complaining, we are expressing a lack of faith. I know that we get overwhelmed by circumstances, which is very, very easy. Something happens, you stub your toe, and so all you can think about is the pain of that, so you're not thankful. <laughs> you're not expressing faith. While Jesus is here, we see that Jesus just wanted a vacation. He wanted some downtime. The Bible says that he went into a home, and you know, this was about a 40 mile distance from where he was uh, just previously. And remember him and his disciples, they couldn't eat because the people kept coming because there was so much great human need. And Christ loves us. He's, fill, he's fulfilling that need. So he wants a little vacation. So he actually travels 40 miles away, enters into a home and says, don't tell anybody I'm here. But the word spreads. That's him. That guy came to our rooming house. That's the guy. And among the first to find him, is the Syrophesian woman. But let's look at the big picture first. We see that Jesus wants downtime, but the people are excited and they respond to his deity appropriately. And what happens? Demons depart. And we also see the deaf and dumb get delivered. Unheard of healings in human history. In Tyre, in verse 37 of Mark 8, they said, they were astonished beyond measure. They were besides themselves with joy. And they said, he has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. One of the most important things that happens, however, in all of scripture is Jesus' interaction. Did you all get your feelings? Interaction with the Syrophoenician woman. I'm going to read this for you. As soon as she heard Christ was there, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. It's curious to me how so many people during that time knew that their children's problems were demonic. A Christian told me, it was Ashley Wallace told me before she left here that think of all the things that we tolerate now that the Bible calls demonic activity, and we just tolerate them as, as if there's some medical condition. Now, the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth. And you notice how the Bible is playing up this thing, that it, the Bible, the Bible is, is actually going to show us something about racism here. That she was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth, which people called dogs in those days. And she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Jesus called her a dog. 
But she answered him, yes, Lord. Even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, for this statement, you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. Now let's, let me give you a little bit of cultural background to this racism thing. During scriptural times, Israel did not treat dogs as man's best friend. Shepherds used them and needed them as partners to help assist out in the fields. You can read about that in Job 31. Job 30, verse 1. But few others did. Among Israelis, dogs were regarded as wild, savage, undomesticated animals that prowled city streets. In fact, they were scavengers. And how many Bible verses can you find in 1st and 2nd Kings where God tells a wicked king, the dogs in the street are going to eat your body? He says this in 1st Kings 14.11. 16, 4, 21, 23 through 24, and in 2 Kings 9, 10, and 36, where God tells Jezebel, the dogs are going to eat you. <laughs> now, Gentiles, by contrast, and especially if you ever look at old Greek art, you, you often see in Greek and sometimes even in Egyptian art, that people are hanging out with their dogs. The Gentiles, by contrast, treated dogs as preferred pets and essential companions. Now, Jesus being in a territory where masters cherish their pets, their dogs, he likens the woman to one who is, though subordinate, is in a proper place under her master's table at his feet where she had fallen in the first place. Now, the woman's sharp Syrophoenician cultural instincts causes her to make a faithful response to what Jesus said. And she says, yes, Lord, I understand and accept my position for the dogs under the table eat of the children's crumbs. Now, the Syrophoenicians were characterized as dogs. That's kind of a racist term. Racism is believing a particular race is superior to one another. But you know what? Romans 3.23, the Bible says that all races are sinners and have fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible says we have a race problem. It's called the human race. We're a human race full of sinners. All problems are resolved by repentance and redemption in the human heart. Not political maneuvering and making laws to designate some as special class protected sinners. All that is going to breed is pride and it's going to encourage you in your sin. That's leaven of, the, of Herod. The politics are trying to get you to wallow in your sin as a special class citizen. That's part of the Laird of heaven, of, 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 the, of the political class, which whom Herod represents. Now, characterizing the Syrophoenicians as dog B, dogs B, what is a, what is a, was it a cultural way ethnicities refer to those whom they dislike, which in this case are Gentiles? We would circle B, right? C, was it something all Gentiles should have used to go to the division of human rights to sue anyone who used the term? D, was it an opportunity for the Syrophesian woman to sue Jesus for defamation and demand that he heal her daughter in return? I doubt if you'll get your chance to do that on judgment day when you face God. I'll give you some more background here. Or let's unpack what she said. What she said or conveyed was something like this. I know that salvation is of the Jews. I know Jews are the first in line for God's care and ministry. They are the primary children of promise God gave Abraham. Jesus was born in Jewelry. We sing that song. 
in jewelry. Is that a little town of Bethlehem that have that line in jewelry he was born? Jew, jewelry. Anyway, what she's saying is I'm not expecting that their rights be denied. I'm not a replacement theology person. I don't believe that the church has replaced Israel. I don't want to usurp my right to suspend their rightful place in God's paradigm and God's plan. But the very fact, Lord Jesus, that you said that the Jews are first means that I could be next. I could be second. She says, I know God is no respecter of persons, despite how we may regard, we may be regarded as dogs by others. And I thus have faith in you, Christ, so I persevere in my petition. Let the plentiful bread of grace still be reserved for the Jewish children. But only let me be as the dog under the table to partake of the crumbs of mercy and comfort that I know is available and surely will fall to me. An African missionary once was beginning a service in, the, in a Boer farmer's house, and he noticed that the, that the coffers were not there. The servants, the slaves were not there. They weren't slaves, they were servants. And he said to the Boer, can they be brought in? And the Boer replied roughly, what have coffers to do with the gospel? Sir, they are dogs. The missionary opened his Bible to this passage of scripture and he read the Syrophoenician women's, woman's reply. The farmer cried, stop, you've broken my head, meaning my pride. Bring the coffers in, or the kafirs in. The Syrophoenician's woman's faith. Some dogs have their day. The Syrophoenician's woman's faith in Mark 7, 28 was honored by Christ because A, though he wanted a break, though he wanted to be on vacation, her persistence paid off. B, Christ only needed the break because he was fully human. The God side of him doesn't need a break. That's why he can still do miracles though he's, though he's dead tired as a human being. B, she acknowledged the natural order of things, that children eat first and then their pets. You know that God's wisdom is consistent with two plus two equals four, the natural order of things? Sometimes people will say to me, well, you, you want me to suspend um, uh, rational thought and just have faith. I'm like, no. Faith in Jesus Christ is consistent with two plus two equals four, the natural order of things. C, she acknowledged that salvation is of the Jews, but Gentiles can participate in it too. D, she exercised faith that Christ can heal. And get this, she'll submit to it any way he wants to go about it. I'm not here to try to demand my rights in Adam to get what I think I should get in this life. I'm appealing to the court of heaven. <coughs> Now, I want to mention something about prayer principles here before we move on. The Syrophoenician woman did not have to bring her daughter to Jesus in person so he could lay hands on her. Maybe she couldn't bring her daughter. Maybe the daughter was too ill to travel. Maybe the daughter was too unruly. Maybe Jesus looked at the Syrophoenician woman's arms and saw the dig marks from her daughter digging into her, digging into her skin. Jesus never says, where's your daughter? He knows where that kid is, and he knows the state that she's in. But here's the point. We can petition Christ to work on behalf of people who are very, 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 very far away from us in terms of physical distance, space, and time. You don't need to be with those people to have God influence them. You just need to get alone and fall to feet of Jesus and petition him to do his work. Amen? Now, all of this commotion, here, here's, this, here's this Jew guy named Jesus. Put yourself in the mind of the, of the Pharisees. Here's this Jew guy named Jesus. Now he's left our territory and he's going up to Tyre and Sidon. He's healing people. They're all praising his name and he's feeding 4,000 people. There's two, 
reasons why we can't have this. Number one, we are the people who other people should be looking to for godly activity, not this guy. And number two, what's he doing messing with those Gentiles anyway? That's something we would never do. So what do they do? They came and they argued with Jesus. Most of your translations say argue, and the King James says question with. Same word. Meaning they disputed with Christ, challenging him. They were seeking a sign that they were not prepared to accept. Why? Because they just wanted to test him. King James says tempt him. I mean, when I first read that in the King James years ago, and I was a young believer, I thought, well, tempt him. What did they do? Tempt him, tempt him to slap him? <laughs> What's the matter with you? Meaning their goal, though, was to attempt to ensnare Christ in his words. Their intent was this. We want a sign. How do we know you're from heaven? Do a sign from heaven. And no matter what he did, they would have parsed the words and said, yeah, well, you just said you were going to do this, and it really was that. Man, what kind of guy are you? They weren't going to accept anything that Jesus did. And you know what? He's not jumping through their hoops. There's a vast difference between what these people were doing and what we do as seekers when we say, God, I am a mess. I am lost. I am hurting. I am broken. I need help. I don't need man's help. If you are God, if you are there, if you're here, show me, please. I once prayed that prayer in desperation after a sleepless night and fell asleep. And I woke up a new creature in Christ. Vast difference between what, what that prayer does for people, how God responds to that cry of faith and anguish with what these people were doing, the Pharisees. And Jesus sighed deeply in his spirit and he said, this generation, and what he means by that is this age of people that are always walking by sight, relying totally on their natural instincts. We have fallen human natures, fallen mentality. We have faulty thinking from the fall. So we use our faulty thinking to craft a religion that makes us great. How's that working for the world that's being thrown under Satan's bus as we speak? He left them and he went to the other side. He left them. Christ is like, talk to the hand because you're not getting anything. He's not your errand boy. You're not going to be able to walk up to heaven someday and pound your chest and say, I'm the man, here I am. I'm the woe man, let me in. So then Jesus turns to his disciples and he says some of the most important things in scripture here. He cautioned them. The King James says he charged them which means he asserted that to his disciples that you are responsible. You have a responsibility to beware. And this word beware is very interesting. It's the word blepo, and it means you are responsible to have a vision to see and to be alert to the dangers of what the leaven, which is the doctrine of the Pharisees, and the leaven, the doctrine of Herod, is going to do to you as a disciple. The name of this message is leaven or the doctrine that destroys discipleship. The leaven or the doctrine that destroys discipleship. And guess what? It's taught by the Pharisees. And it's actually taught by Herod, whose religious agents are called the Herodians. 
Now, as John explained in the beginning, leaven is sourdough in a high state of fermentation. Oh, I want to give you this. Um, well, I'll, I'll give you. The, I'll give you the, um, the the equation in a minute. Leaven is the chemical breakdown of a substance by bacteria, yeast, or other micro, microorganisms, typically involving effervescence. That means it, it gives off heat. In other words, you won't be on fire for Christ following the leaven of the Pharisees and Herod. Leaven metaphorically is what happens when error is mixed with truth and when truth is mixed with error and vice versa. In other words, if you believe and buy into the doctrines of the politically correct religious crowd, the 501c3 religious crowd, represented by the Pharisees and the politically appointed PC government crowd, represented by Herod, you'll lose your fire and zeal for God. It's expressed in this equation. Pharisees plus Herod equal doctrine that destroys disciples, the church, and all the good God wants to do through his disciples in the church, in the world. You got that in your notes, I believe, don't you? All right, we're not going to leave anything to chance with that. So here we are in the United States of America. We have this thing called the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. We also have a Declaration of Independence that mentions God. But we have the, the, the 501c3 leaven, the lie that says, those aren't true. Oh, no, it's not. There's no biblical basis to the Bill of Rights. God is separate from what man creates in government, civic affairs, and politics. God is separate from his creation. So we can make up anything we want about the environment and sustainability and Christian people just go silent because they aren't really faithful to what God says in Genesis 131 that everything he made is very good. So they make laws outlawing what I just said. But it doesn't change the black and white words on the page of the Bible. And it does not change that when these people stand before God, he is going to hold them accountable for lying about him being a good creator who made a totally sustainable planet. We gotta get some college kids in here because I'll help you write your papers. You won't be listening to your college professors lie to you after you listen to these sermons. You'll be able to take them on. They'll have to ban you from the classroom because they can't argue with truth. Now the leaven of this doctrine, oh, here's, a, here's, more, here's the leaven of Herod today in our society. Today, politicians justify all sorts of anti-biblical behavior by saying it becomes your political right. They're basically saying we have to promote sin because it's un-American to not make every sin a legal right. That's the leaven of Herod. Now, the leaven of this doctrine burns off the original intent of America's Christian constitutional framers who are inspired by God. And it leaves our nation wallowing in a lukewarm moral morass that Christ says in Revelation 3.16, I'm gonna spew it out of my mouth. I'm gonna go I know it's gross, isn't it? But that's what he's gonna do. What's the alternative? The alternative is to be a discerning disciple who tears down satanic strongholds that human reasoning from fallen human nature erects trying to deceive us as to what is really God's truth. We saw this Brexit vote where people in England, the common folk are trying to get their autonomy back. I don't think they're going to. Because the people that have power, they're slick. And they have nothing better to do. They have all the money in the world, because when they print the government's money, the government, oh, we all owe them that money back plus interest. And they're sitting around right now scheming what they're going to do to the people of England to keep them under their thumb. However, there are some battles, though you may not win, you have to fight them. And, I, and, I, and I'm praying for the people of England. They voted right. 
The political class wants all those people under the thumb of some global government initiative run by people that we don't vote for and elect. And they're telling us, oh, you have to do this because your economy is going to be bad and, and, the, and, the, and the environment's going to be bad and everything's going to be bad. And they got to tell us all this stuff because if they can create a big global problem that is so terrible that five minutes from now the world is going to turn brown and it's never going to turn green again and we'll never be able to eat, then we will turn sovereignty over to unelected officials who are working for somebody, somebody appoints them, we will turn our sovereignty over to unelected officials who do not have our best interest at heart, despite the positive talking points of their policies. Because if they did, they wouldn't be lying to lead us astray. Ten Commandment number nine, lying leads us astray. So what is, what is Christ calling us to be? He's calling us to be discerning disciples who do not read his word through the paradigm of the lie. He's calling us to be people who just read his word. This is how I stumbled, I believe led by the Holy Spirit, I call it stumbling, into, all the, into, into what, I fit, what, what I'm just telling you. I started hearing all this sustainability stuff years ago and I started looking at scripture and I said, wait a minute, God said everything he made was good. You know what a nurse in a burn unit, in a skin care unit told me not too long ago? She said, if you get bed sores in my unit, I slather my hand with petroleum jelly and I stick it into your body. I had a medical procedure this week and they had to blow CO2 into my body. And they said, I did it without anesthesia. And they said, it's going to be a lot easier this time than the last time we did it, because last time we had to use oxygen, which has to be mixed, because oxygen is kind of poison if it's not mixed with something right. But CO2 absorbs into the body. And I said, why aren't you medical professionals writing letters to the editor in the newspaper telling them that they're lying to us about petroleum and CO2? They weren't discerning disciples. I'm praying that they become one. Because the whole world is at stake because lying leads us astray, but discerning disciples will stand in the gap.